The next thing we're going to look at is what happens to the potential energy in rings? And what shapes do rings make? We're going to start this by looking at some data. We don't look at a whole lot of data in this course. We very often just give you the answer. But it is important to begin to be able to look at experiments and look at data and draw some conclusions. So let's take a look at this data. So we're going to look at a combustion uh, reaction. In a combustion reaction, we take a molecule, like for example, a hydrocarbon, and we allow it to react with oxygen gas. In the process, the original hydrocarbon gets broken apart into separated atoms, and then those combine with the oxygens, and our products are going to be CO2 and H2O. So, this turns out to be an exothermic process. It releases heat. One of the reasons for that is that um, it's releasing the potential energy that was stored in the original molecule that we allowed to combust. So we can get an idea of how much potential energy is stored by looking at the relative amounts of heat released as different molecules are burned. We do this in something like a bomb calorimeter. So this is a calorimetry experiment. Now, we're going to look at a set of data for small cyclic alkanes. And I first want to assure you, you are not required to memorize these data or these numbers. You are, however, going to be responsible for knowing the trend that we get by analyzing these numbers. Okay, so we're gonna start by looking at various size of rings. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight rings of carbon. We call these, whatever the number is, membered rings. So for example, a ring of three carbons would be a three-membered ring. It would also, if it were a simple ring, it would have uh, a chemical name. So for example, a three-membered ring with only carbons and hydrogens and no double bonds would be cyclopropane. Four would be cyclobutane, and so forth. So. These molecules were burned in a bomb calorimeter, and these are the numbers that were obtained. A three-membered ring gave off just a little bit less than 500 kilocalories per mole, a four-membered 656, and so forth. Now, this is the really interesting thing about looking at data, because what we have to do when we look at an experiment and we look at data, we have to begin to ask ourselves, are we getting at what we want to know? So for example, the larger the heat of combustion, the more potential energy that was released. So looking at this table of numbers, we would conclude that cyclooctane released the most potential energy. Now, when you release potential energy, it means you start at a high potential energy, in other words, you're unstable, and you go down to a low potential energy. So, by looking at these numbers, we might conclude that cyclooctane is the most unstable ring out of all of these, it has the most potential energy in it. The problem with that is that the way that that experiment works is we break bonds and then we create new bonds and in that process potential energy is released every time we break a bond and every time we create a new bond. So when we burn a larger molecule it just makes sense that there's more bonds being broken, more bonds being formed, so the amount of potential energy released should just naturally increase. So that's not really allowing us to compare directly the potential energy in the rings because what we're more interested in is how much potential energy is just stored by the fact that it's a ring. So what we're going to do is 
we're going to take this number and divide it by the number of carbons. So what we're doing now is we're going to look at how much potential energy is there for, every, for each carbon plus two hydrogens, the heat of combustion per CH2. This turns out to be something that we very often have to do in data. We often have to do things like normalizing. This is an example of normalizing, where we take the, the sample size and we divide them by a factor so that we're comparing effectively the same size of sample so the numbers become more comparable. This is not manipulating data per se. What it is, is looking at the way the data was collected and presented and critiquing it using critical thinking to, uh, to make it more sensible, to make it have more information that is actually useful. When we do this, normalizing these heats of combustions to the number of carbons in the ring, we get a really different trend. The first thing we can see is that the numbers actually are, relatively speaking, pretty close. So for example, these numbers differ by 750 or so, whereas these numbers differ by just a few kilocalories. The other thing we can see is that now, actually, the three-membered ring has the highest amount of potential energy per CH2. And that potential energy goes down when we go to a four-membered ring, goes down even further when we go to a five-membered ring, then it starts going back up. I'm sorry, then it goes down to a minimum at a six-membered ring. Then it starts going back up. It gets a little higher for the seven, a little higher for eight. If we were to continue this, you, we would see that it maxes out again around the eight, it begins to go back down again, and by about 12, it reaches the same amount as it is for six. So what we would conclude then is that the six-membered ring has extra potential, uh, I'm sorry, has, I'm sorry. So what we would conclude then is that the three-membered ring has an extra amount of potential energy stored when compared to the six-membered ring. So the next interesting thing then is to look at how much potential energy would there be if there weren't a ring. Now, the problem with that is that if I were to just, for example, take hexane and burn it, the number would go up a little bit because hexane has two extra hydrogens when compared to cyclohexane. So two extra sets of bonds being formed, a little bit more potential energy released. So what we did or what was done was they burned a very, very long chain of carbons where the two extra carbons would basically release such a small amount of potential energy relative to the total amount that the contribution would end up in the non-significant figs. And when they did that, we found that an open chain carbon, an open, uh, uh, and when we did that, we found that a chain of carbons, which was not a ring, which we call an open chain molecule, that that has approximately 157.4 kilocalories per mole per CH2, which is actually the same number as we get for cyclohexane. So then we looked and we said, okay, so how much potential energy is being added by making a chain of carbons into a ring? Well, we can see that since cyclohexane has the same amount of potential energy, whether it's in a ring or in a chain, that must have zero amount of extra potential energy. What we can then do is find the amount of potential energy per CH2 for a given molecule, subtract the baseline, which would be 157.4, which would be how much it has if it's not in a ring, and then multiply that difference times the number of atoms. And when we do that, we get these numbers. So this represents the total amount of 
potential energy that is added when you take a ring, uh, sorry, a chain of carbons of this length and make it into a ring. And we call that the ring strain. How much extra potential energy is there in a ring when compared to a chain of carbons of the same length? What we can see with regard to ring strain then is we can see that actually, in contrast to what we might have concluded just looking at the raw numbers, we can see that the three-membered ring has the highest amount of ring strain at almost 28 kilocalories per mole. The cyclobutane has a little bit of less. Then when we go to the cyclopentane, you can see that the amount of strain goes down dramatically. There's zero ring strain in cyclohexane. It goes back up for cycloheptane. It goes back up again for cyclooctane. And then as I indicated, it starts to go back down until it reaches zero again at about 12. Much of what I just described is written out here. So you can use that to kind of follow along with my argument. Here then is where we define the ring strain. Ring strain is the increased potential energy of a ring or cyclic compound when we compare it to the same sized open chain compound. It's essentially a measure of how stable the ring is. So a ring which has a high amount of strain would be unstable compared to a ring with a low amount of strain. So three-membered rings are unstable, six-membered rings are much more stable. Now when organic chemists discover something like this, the next thing they do is they ask why. They want to understand why would a three-membered ring have more potential energy in it, be less stable, than say, for example, a six-membered ring. In looking at ring strain, we have identified two main causes of ring strain. The first is called angle strain. Now, angle strain is defined as the increased potential energy in a compound that is caused by forcing bonds to have a different value from their ideal value. Angle strain is an important factor in the ring strain of three-membered and four-membered rings, but once we go beyond that, angle strain becomes negligible. So let's look at this. So when we look at a carbon of a three-membered ring, we can see that it's going to have two hydrogens attached, and then it's going to have a bond and a bond to the other neighboring carbons in the ring. Well, a three-membered ring is going to be an equilateral triangle. And when we look at an equilateral triangle, we know that the angle between the sides, in other words, the angle between the bonds, would be 60 degrees. However, the carbons, which would be central atoms in that molecule, have a steric number of four, so their ideal bond angle would be tetrahedral at 109.5 degrees. So what I've done in this diagram is I have aligned one of the bonds with one of the sides of this ideal angle, and then I've indicated where the other side of the ideal angle would be. So this is an angle of 109.5 degrees. You can see that the actual angle is significantly smaller. It's like we took this dotted line and forced it over to here. There's a change of almost 50 degrees. So it's just a little bit more than half the size of what it should be. It turns out as we squeeze that, the electrons in those bonds are going to repel each other and the potential energy is going to increase a great deal. Similarly, when we look at cyclobutane, our ideal bond angle would be 109, but cyclobutane, assuming it's a square, would have a bond angle of 90. So again, it would be compressed, which would raise the amount of potential energy. The other source of ring strain is what's called torsional strain. Torsional strain is caused by eclipsing of bonds in the ring. <coughs> because the chains of a ring cannot rotate, they would be forced to have eclipsing interactions if they are planar. 
Now, what we've done here is we have drawn a Newman projection along one bond of a cyclopropane. So, in a cyclopropane, we would start at one carbon, we would look down the bond to the second carbon. Those two carbons would be connected together by a bond that's hidden. They would have two hydrogens on them. Then, the front carbon would also have a bond to the third carbon in the ring, and the back carbon would have a bond to the third carbon in the ring. Those two bonds would be parallel to each other because they both have to attach to this same point here. And in fact, this entire structure would effectively be planar because three points define a plane. So the three atoms have to lie in a plane. As a result, you can see that this molecule would be forced to be eclipsed and it would have an increase in potential energy because of this interaction, this interaction, then if we rotated it, we would have eclipsing from here to here and here to here. We also have eclipsing of these bonds. All of that eclipsing is going to increase the potential energy, just like eclipsing increases the potential energy in ethane or butane. So by adding up the ring potential energy plus the eclipsing potential energy, we would get the total amount of increased potential energy. That would be the ring strain. In this one, uh, picture, what we're doing is we're taking the square, so here's the square, and we're looking down one bond and simultaneously down another bond, which is parallel. So if the square were flat, we would have one bond here, one bond there, and then two other bonds connecting between one on the front carbon and then one on the back carbon. And again, you can see how this would be forced to be eclipsed and there would be a lot of eclipsing interactions and the potential energy would go up. In order to relieve these eclipsing interactions, some rings distort by rotating slightly around the bonds and bending atoms out of the plane. These distortions create what we would call ring conformations. So here are a couple of examples. If the cyclobutane were perfectly flat, this bond and these two bonds would all be in the plane. So it would look like this, coming to the dotted thing. What cyclobutane does is it takes one of its points and it rotates it up out of the plane so that it assumes this sort of bent shape here. What this does, imagining looking down this bond, and you can see this really well if you build models, it would cause that bond to become partially staggered. And that would reduce the eclipsing and it would lower the potential energy. So in fact, what we see is the cyclobutane forms the bent conformation in preference to being flat. Similarly, a cyclopentane can take one of its points and move it up out of the plane. Again, looking down the bond, that would make that bond staggered. Now, the only problem for the cyclobutane is that it can't do this with more than one of its bonds. So, some of the other bonds are still eclipsed, and this is one of the reasons why cyclopentane has a small amount of potential energy in it when compared to cyclohexane where there is no eclipsing. We call this conformation the envelope conformation. Imagining that this would sort of be the part of the envelope you stick the paper in and then here's the flap that you fold over. 